There was a meeting between uh, High Representative uh, and the Iranian Foreign Minister in New Delhi earlier this morning. And uh, of course, they discussed the latest developments um, around the JCPOA, around the nuclear deal and the procedures which were uh, initiated recently. They discussed also the wider situation in the region. Uh, you know that HRVP was in uh, repeated contacts with Minister Zarif and now they met in person in New Delhi to continue their engagement. They agreed to continue their engagement also in the near future, in the coming uh, days and weeks. Um, when it comes to the remarks uh, by Iranian uh, representatives addressed to the E3, you know, it's not up to us to comment. We are not E3. The EU is the coordinator. We have dialogue with them and as we have with all the other participants of this agreement. And we talk to everyone about the pressing issues and in order to make this agreement work again and to preserve this agreement because it's a very important agreement. Follow up. Just, uh, uh, can you confirm the Washington Post article about uh, that Trump secretly threatened the three capitals like uh, to impose 25% tariffs on European cars. Again, I can speak on behalf of the EU as a coordinator of the JCPOA. I cannot speak on behalf of the US administration or on behalf of the E3. So I cannot confirm or deny or comment any reports uh, involving uh, alleged communication or alleged threats or alleged anything in relation to partners for whom I am not uh, really able to talk. Thank you very much. Oh, is it also for Peter? Yes, it is. Uh, same subject. Hi, Peter. Lawrence Norman, Wall Street Journal. Um, Peter, is Burrell's offer to Zarif to come to Brussels still on the table as part of those ongoing engagements? Do you know if he will come? And can you tell us anything more about the uh, substance of their frank discussion on the JCPOA? Thank you very much. As we have been discussing um, in the last few weeks, the invitation still stands, but obviously the first contact in person has been met. Before this personal meeting in New Delhi, they were in, in repeated and uh, continuous uh, contact also through other means, meaning, I mean, there are phones, there are other means of communication. And of course, they agreed to continue the engagement wherever it is um, convenient for both sides. So, of course, be it Brussels, be it different venue, you know that there are also multilateral fora and international events, so they are committed to meet, and if there is a will, there is a way. So, when there is a date and when there is a place, again, in the view and in the scheduling, then they would meet again. And on their frank discussion and frank dialogue, you know that uh, we communicate with all the partners. It's in our interest and now the HRVP has also a clear mandate specifically for these issues when it comes to the wider uh, situation in the region concerning Iran and also Libya. He has strong mandate to reach out to all parties so of course I mean he engages in, in dialogues and in, uh, consultations and discussions and uh, on this uh, on this uh, meeting between the two of them, Minister Zarif and HRVP Borel, we issued a press release, it's uh, on the EAS website so I can just uh, briefly summarize, they discussed the latest developments related to both JCPOA and to the situation in the region. Um, HRVP Borel um, underlined the continued interest of the European Union to preserve the nuclear deal and also the strong interest of the EU to be able to contribute to the de-escalation in the region. And uh, yes, they will, they will continue in this contact. You have a follow up, Lawrence? Yeah, I do. Is he, um, is he seeing either of the Russian or the Chinese foreign minister, uh, also participants in the JCPOA, in, at the New Delhi meeting, and do we have any greater f um, clarity about when he might go to Baghdad? On these, uh, many meetings are planned, many meetings are scheduled. At this point, I will be able to confirm only those meetings which actually took place. This is also due to the time difference between here and uh, New Delhi, and also due to the scheduling on different sites, but there are contacts and uh, if there is specific meeting at a specific time and specific place, we will either announce it ahead or we will issue then uh, information to you when such meetings happen. And on Baghdad, the same. I mean, uh, when we have something uh, more concrete, then we will be happy to share it. Thank you. Are there more questions for Peter specifically? Mose, please. Oh, sorry. Um, it's, it was first Mose, and then it will be you. Sorry. Thank you, Dana. Uh, yes, Peter, I would like to ask another question which you probably can answer this time because it's about EU's position on a related issue in the region. 
and um, which I've been trying to follow. It's the humanitarian situation in northeast uh, Syria, and uh, you stand on that, especially on the autonomous uh, Kurdish uh, uh, administration there. I mean, uh, I noticed that uh, you issued a statement uh, last Monday evening uh, criticizing um, a resolution by United Security Council on, on access to aid, to matter aid to this region, and where you regretted uh, the limited scope uh, of the cross points and so on uh, into northeast Syria, and also the limited time frame of, uh, of that aid. Uh, uh, and also, the I might recall also that uh, uh, the statement mentioned that um, the latest hostilities, and you didn't mention it explicitly, but you're referring, I suppose, to the invasion by Turkey or Turkish proxy forces, North East Syria last, last autumn, has caused uh, uh, displacement of 300,000 people. Uh, now my question is, uh, is this uh, is this related to the difficulties of humanitarian organizations to provide aid to North East Syria? Is that because uh, the administration there is not recognized uh, by anyone yet? I mean, we understand that uh, the Assad regime in Turkey are not willing to recognize them, but uh, EU's position has been that, uh, that the peace process should be inclusive and include all, let's say, stakeholders in the future of, of Syria. And we know that um, because they're not recognized, the international humanitarian organization has difficulties uh, in providing that aid. Could you please explain, I mean, uh, the situation there? And, and, and a very small question. Now when uh, Borel is in New Delhi, did they take the opportunity in connection with this uh, Raisina dialogue also to raise, to discuss with the <laughs> Indian government about the situation in Kashmir and also the, the recent uh, new citizenship law in, in India which seems to discriminate against uh, Muslims? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think I will share the India part with my colleague Virginie, but uh, there were indeed uh, meetings with Indian counterparts or are planned still uh, during um, HRVP's stay in New Delhi, but uh, Virginie maybe can share more information with you on this specific one on uh, meeting with Indian counterparts. On Syria, exactly as your question indicates, this is a huge topic and very complex as well. We not only have the Northeast, we also have the Northwest, where the concerns are even more immediate, because if we take this area uh, in simplified terms referred to as the province of Idlib, which is under the control of the terrorist organization HTS, this is also a huge concern. And this is, I think, the more immediate concern, because we see that uh, there are ongoing confrontations going on, that the regime, together with its uh, Russian allies, relaunched the military operations, which once again, do not distinguish between military targets and civilian targets. So we see the rising toll, we see the rising number of civil, civilian casualties there, and that's where our concerns are most uh, recently focused on, and where also the access for the humanitarian assistance is very crucial. And from where we have the risk of um, having more uh, refugee influx or more influx of people who are internally displayed, you know that Idlib is full of internally displaced, displaced people already from other parts of Syria and they are basically enclosed there. So bottom line is the situation there is very worrying. We have been expressing our concerns repeatedly, most recently in the last uh, joint statement by Commissioner Lenarcic and HRVP, where we have uh, also made the point of the need to be able to provide for the civilians who are trapped in the fighting. And this once again underlines the need to find the solution if there is a ceasefire brokered either by the Russians, by the Turks, by the Syrian regime in the Astana format or in whatever other format, it needs to be upheld and we need to have the, the needs of the civilians on our minds as a first priority. And this is what the EU does. Even in these very complicated and difficult circumstances, we continue to provide the assistance to these people or at least advance our efforts to be able to provide the, the assistance to these people. So indeed, but the, again, we are really underlining and calling again for stopping of the military operations and really finding a solution in the, in the Geneva format of the, of the talks um, to find, uh, under the auspices of the UN, to find the political solution and to solve the situation in Syria once for all. Um, Mo, do you have a follow-up on this one? Sure. Okay. Thank you, um, Pete, for, for this explanation. Just a very quick follow-up, I mean, uh, is it not time for EU, let's say, to reconsider its position on 
whether this autonomous college administration should recognize them in order to enable, let's say, humanitarian aid to the area and also their uh, participation in, in future peace talks. Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the start of your question. Isn't it time to recognize the Kurdish authorities in the <coughs> Northeast? That's not for the EU. You know that the question of recognition is for the individual member states, so not up, uh, up to me to comment on this. Thank you. I would first want to see if there are additional questions for Peter before calling Virginie to take your question on India. But we have that one for Peter as well. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's uh, on Iran again. Um, from, from Tehran, there are specific complainings. Um, they basically are blaming the European Union because they stopped uh, the uh, oil uh, mm, mm, trade. So they basically are complaining because according to them, Europeans stopped to respect the GPCOA by not uh, buying the uh, Iranian oil and because the EU enterprises apparently are not on the ground and not, are not making business with the uh, Iranian uh, SMEs. I was wondering whether uh, you have anything um, to, to, to say about this and maybe uh, whether y the European Commission can provide us a uh, uh, detailed situation over the trade flows between the European Union and Iran. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, on the first part of your question, we don't really feel to be the recipients of these complaints or of these statements about how much the Europeans have done because we understand that I think the Iranian uh, representatives and officials are quite clear in who they mean when they criticize because the EU as such is the coordinator. We don't have the competencies or the powers or the rights to make clear-cut decisions and, the impl and, uh, and implement them. We oversee the process and we try to mediate between the parties. So if there are commitments, they are for the signatories of this agreement. And what we were saying as a coordinator and what HRVP repeated most recently in his statement uh, two days ago and also in his uh, discussion in European Parliament was that we really encourage all to approach the processes uh, related to JCPOA um, to act in good faith and go back to the full fulfillment and full compliance with their commitments stemming from this treaty because the parties of this treaty when they signed the deal they made commitments so what they will do and we are encouraging them to to continue doing so so it applies to all the parties. It applies to Iran because Iran has scaled down its commitments in five steps which have been announced. And we, we in the reaction, we said that we urge Iran to go back to the full compliance with the JCPOA. But at the same time, we are saying if this deal is to survive, it needs to be uh, really uh, supported by everyone who is uh, the signatory of this deal. And on the trade issues, we can, we can provide you with some numbers, but as you can imagine, it's not huge volumes and the um, relations and the exchanges are more in the level of like people to people contacts, education, science and, um, science and research and, and similar, but we can provide you with some, some facts and numbers on that. Thank you. Are there more questions for Peter? Lawrence, you're for Peter? Yeah, sorry, Peter, you, you can't get away with that. I've got Zarif's tweets in front of me. He talks about the failure to implement the blocking statute. That's an EU law. He talks about empty statements that were issued. Those were issued by Mogherini. He's also talked about the 11 promises that were given in July, uh, I think 2019, of, of things that the EU would do to, uh, to deal with shipping insurance. He's talking about the EU as much as the E3. So is it really not appropriate to respond? Again, EU represented in this case by HRVP is the coordinator of um, the agreement. So the one who is facilitating and mediating among the individual parties and signatories to make sure that, the, um, that there is mutual understanding about what needs to be done. If there are problems, to try to solve the problems by engaging with them. And uh, as far as HRVP Jose Borrell is concerned, right from the start of his mandate as HRVP and Vice President of the Commission, in his position um, related to the nuclear treaty, he underlined his personal commitment to fulfill his tasks uh, stemming from his role and stemming from this deal to the fullest with his really strong personal engagement. And I think he proves it with his 
communication with all the partners, with his outreach to all the partners, and now most recently also with, uh, with Minister Zarif. And you know that we do not really engage in, uh, in uh, communication over different types of media, be it social or printed or electronic. If we have something to discuss, if we have criticism con to convey or the praise or suggestions to, to make, we do it in the, in the mutual engagement in the good old fashioned diplomatic way. That means in the exchanges behind the table, somewhere in the nice room or over the phone. So not really commenting on everything that has been said by the partners in the public domain, but we do it uh, face to face. And we have the advantage that we can talk to everyone about everything in good faith because we are the coordinator and this is what is expected from us. So the EU is here as an honest broker trying to deliver on, on its promises. Thank you. Are there any more questions for Peter? They aren't. Thank you.